And happy Tuesday, NCAA basketball fans. This is your weekly Trogcast, two really old guys talking NCAA basketball. And it continues to be quite a whirlwind. Before we get to that, we will say, uh, here's Jeff Zink. I'm going to say hi to my partner in crime, Jim Reeker. Jim, how are you doing today? Pretty good. Hey, welcome back from the, the Great West. Uh, come back to this uh, Midwest. You brought a little bit of warm weather. We're not too bad today. Of course, we're headed, I think, back into the winter time. But uh, good to have you back, Jeff. Yeah, it, it's fun. I got to spend a week out in Arizona with the Cincinnati Reds Hall of Fame Fantasy Camp. Always a, a good time out there helping them go that, watching 144 guys return to their youth and uh, have, have just have a great time. If you ever looking for something to do in the middle of January and you got to go out there, it's tough. You know, I'll tell you, 75 and sunny every day. You really got to suck it up to play a little ball out there in Goodyear. Well, did you uh, did you happen to slip into any games this year? I I, I was able to save my knees. I, I became a designated runner there at the end. Not too much because our team was uh, pitching heavy and, and batting slim. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, we but we were able to get in there and run a few times and uh, warm up the pitchers. But uh, luckily, not too many guys went down for the count. We had our full contingent just about all week, and that's what it's all about, let those guys play. And shout out to my two coaches who were great, Tommy Helms, the, the Rookie of the Year, and Gold Glover, who was participating in his last fantasy camp. Uh, Tommy, 77 years young and still at it. And uh, Aaron Harang, who – and uh, here, here's – we'll just throw the touch before we get started. I didn't know this until I, I looked him up. Aaron Harang, only pitcher in Major League Baseball history, to not win the Cy Young in a year where he led the league in wins and strikeouts, but more than that, did not even get one vote for the Cy Young. So that, there's no love there for the big Aaron, Aaron, as I'm, we call it. I'm there. taking it the Reds didn't have a very good year that year, probably. Actually, they just missed going to the playoffs. They lost out to St. Louis by a couple of games, which is what's even more surprising. No love for the Red Legs. But we're not here to talk baseball, and maybe that comes out, even though pitchers and catchers report in just about uh, two and a half weeks. We're here to talk basketball. And Lord have mercy, how many times can we say it's, it's in a mad, 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 mad world? Another topsy-turvy week. And I counted up, talked to you a little bit last night, in the last two weeks, 32 losses to top 25 teams, 22 of those to unranked teams, only eight of them to higher ranked teams, and two of them to lower ranked teams. It, I, the blender just keeps making everything into one big smoothie mix, doesn't it? Yeah, and it uh, happened again last night. Uh, Virginia Tech uh, knocked off the number 10 uh, Tar Heels from North Carolina, and TCU, who had fallen out of the uh, top 25, uh, defeated number seven West Virginia on their home court, on mm-hmm. TCU's home court. So it just it just continues almost uh, not even weekly, but daily. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I actually included those in the stats. And when you look at it, you know, some of them aren't that big a surprise. And, and people are going to say, "Well, we go back in two weeks, and we can count up last week." I think I counted 16 of those losses were last week. Some of them aren't. Two big of surprises, you know, when Michigan beats Michigan State, that's one of those rivalry games in uh, Oklahoma, lost to Oklahoma State. Again, uh, rivalry sort of things. But but some of these, I mean, it just, you know, West Virginia losing again after losing at home to Kansas and Texas Tech and TCU, um, you know, when they were up to all the way to number two in the country, uh, to me, that's got to be the, the, the biggest downfall. Um, uh, who else do you see that's just sort of surprised you that's falling off the map here? Well, uh, just a comment. I think it, it just uh, overall it's just uh, parody that mm-hmm. uh, this uh, NCAA overall, I think uh, one to 100 probably is uh, just closer than it's ever been. The talent's more spread out than it's ever been. We don't have the uh, uh, teams that uh, just uh, dominate, you know, four or five teams at the top that don't lose uh, very often. Uh, Anybody can beat anybody on uh, any given night. Uh, And uh, so... uh, And they're proving it, yeah. (laughs) And they're proving it. So it's going to make, I think, again, you don't like to look that far down the road, but I always do. I think it's going to make for an unbelievable march 
it's going to be anybody's game. You know, I said 12. <clears throat> there might be 25 teams in the country if they get hot at the right time could win uh, the uh, the whole shebang. You know, th- talk about Kentucky, who's really – you talk about a team that's fallen off the map in your uh, SEC, uh, you know, they fell out of the top 25 for the first time in 68 weeks. I think, mm-hmm. yeah, I go back to 2000. 14, last time they were out of the top 25. Of course, if you look at that 13-14 season, I think that was a season that they actually ended up going to the final game after they right. had fallen out of the 25. They had, they got hot. And, of course, maybe that's the uh, hope of the U.K. fans this year, that maybe this team can come together and make a run because it doesn't look like they're going to contend for the uh, SEC championship, although they're not too far out yet. But they've got a couple of tough games coming up. I think they play Mississippi State tonight. And then they travel to West Virginia on Saturday. And, of course, uh, that's going to be a tough one for them. Well, I'd agree with you. And that's something we were going to talk about is who was on the ropes in each conference and who are the sleepers that are still out there. And I'd have to say that just what you said, Kentucky's got to be the team on the ropes. uh, They've fallen out of the top 25. Um, I mean, they are still at at just four and three in the conference. So they're not too far out of it in two games. But – Climbing over three other teams isn't all that easy, especially when you got Tennessee nipping at your heels. And you just got to wonder, you know, a big surprise. I mean, it was a good game. It was a tight game. And a team like Florida are always going to give you a battle. But it, it used to be that Rupp was just a place you – they just wouldn't let anybody come in and beat them and to, to lose a game like that. So I would definitely say Kentucky, like you just said, is, is my team uh, – that's uh, on the ropes a little bit because it just doesn't seem, and you've said this a couple times in the past, that the the group they have there isn't as talented as they've had them in the past. Uh, you know, that's saying something because they're a very talented group, but um, they just don't have what they have. And you know, coming off a loss at South Carolina, which is down, you know, like you, you said, that it doesn't need Mississippi State, and then they got West Virginia. Um, I'm not so sure they're going to be able to make the run they have in the past. Yeah, you talk to UK fans, and uh, I did watch uh, maybe the last ten minutes of that game. And uh, but what I hear is they don't play together well. They go through streaks where they don't score. Mm-hmm. Um, they seem to be more of a group of individuals out to get their own uh, glory and stats to move on to the next level as quickly as possible. And I, I've said this I think before. I just think the UK way, so to speak, the Calipari way just doesn't get it done anymore. Experience seems to be the important factor in college basketball. Those teams that can keep uh, guys around for three or four years and build some continuity, uh, those are the teams that uh, seem to be doing better now. And uh, mm-hmm. although we don't see it too – although it's affected Kansas a little bit, you know, they're kind of a home for one and dunners. And, and Duke, you know, Duke's having a pretty good year, but their two losses were to teams that uh, you wouldn't expect them to lose to that uh, probably, again, that experience factor uh, had a key role in uh, playing out. I just, I'm talking about all your conferences today. <laughs> yeah, well, well the, the, but those are the ones that you – know, so I'll just continue on uh, the teams on the ropes in my conferences then, and you can go to yours. I would say right now probably the one – are you extracting teeth again today? You got the to... – or I must have hit, hit my microphone or something. Yeah. Like that, yeah. All right. The, uh, yeah. Uh, right now, the team, and it's not a big on the ropes, would have to be the Arizona Sun Devils. I think uh, they just uh, yeah. sort of leveled yeah. out. They're down to number 21. Um, you know, Bobby Hurley got them uh, hot quick. Uh, you know, all four of their losses are in the, the Pac-12. Um and they just, uh, they've just not been able to – I think people just, like I said the last time, film kind of equals things out. Still going to be a good team, but, you know, they might just be a, a year away. It's always tough to get out of there. So that's, um, that's going to be tough for them to go. They're still 21st in the nation, and I think they're going to be there. But they're a little on the road, so they've got to watch it. Um, you know, lost, lost to Stanford at Stanford. Stanford almost pulled off the double against Arizona, but Arizona pulled it out away. But um, you know, out there, I think Arizona has finally righted the ship, and it's going to be a tough one. And my uh, my sleepers in the, in the ACC, uh, excuse me, uh, the one on the rope in the ACC, 
I'm going to surprise you a little bit. I, I think it's Notre Dame. They just can't seem to get it together. Mike Bray hasn't done it. They've lost four in a row. And who would believe that out of the Irish? Georgia Tech, you know, you know two of them are North Carolina and Clemson. They also lost to Louisville. And when you get in the ACC, there's about anything that happened. Uh, but, you know, they, they had those early losses, too, to Ball State and Indiana, who's not nearly as good as you would think that program would imply. And their only signature win is against uh, Wichita State earlier in the year. So um, as things level out, uh, you're seeing some of these teams fall out a little bit, and I think those are the teams in my conferences that have got to watch uh, how they play through the rest of the season. Yeah, just to note, uh, Bonzi Colson is out at Notre Dame, and they're hoping to get him back sometime near the end of the season, but I think that's had a major factor <clears throat> maybe on their performance. <clears throat> Excuse me. Since uh, you know, in the ACC, it, it comes at you every night, and so I think they're they're down a little bit, and that might be uh, the factor there. Um, if uh, I look at the Big Twelve, the team, <clears throat> kind of the surprise team, maybe was the sleeper, and now might be the team on the ropes a little bit, having lost their last two, and uh, they actually play Kansas tonight. Going to be a big game. That's Oklahoma. Oklahoma, of course, with freshman sensational Trey Young. And uh, here's what I think's happened there is, uh, you know, he's still leading the country in scoring, scoring a little bit over 30 points a game and, and in assists also at 9.7 assists a game. In fact, if he can uh, continue through the season to lead those two categories, he will be the first player in NCAA history to lead both those categories, which would be an amazing um, accomplishment for a freshman. The thing is, is the word I just said, freshman, and I think things have kind of caught up with him a little bit, and that's the reason they've lost uh, their last two. Um, in fact, he set a record, in, uh, a Big 12 record that you wouldn't want to set. I, can't, I think it was against Kansas State. He had 12 turnovers himself. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. So, uh, And I think here's the problem is he's still getting his points and assists, but I don't think he can carry the entire team uh, through that tough grinder of a Big 12 uh, schedule that they have. So uh, it's going to be interesting to see it. And, again, I, tonight I think is a, a tipping point for them. If they could upset Kansas, uh, they could pull themselves back in to the race maybe. But if Kansas uh, wins that game, I think that kind of will put Oklahoma a little too far out uh, to come back with the remainder of the season. And, of course, a surprise to me, maybe, and some people, because we just didn't think Kansas was as good this year. But you look at the standings, and they've uh, got it together, and things going their way. Uh, sitting at the top of the conference at six and one right now, and West Virginia is the closest to them, and they already have three losses with last night's loss to TCU. Well, I'm with you there. I know, and I know uh, you, you said you thought it was the time for for Kansas to, to give that up, but you know they're not going to. No, this is this is a must-win game for Oklahoma if they're going to win the Big 12. They can't go to four losses and have Kansas be three ahead of them. Uh, you know, a lot of the season left, but uh, and uh, Bill Self's got them them right there in Kansas, so that's pretty good. Who so other? Uh, who else might be on the ropes for you? Well, <clears throat> let's go to the uh, the Big Ten. Um, Big Ten. On the ropes, I don't know, but Michigan State has fallen two games out. Now they're not on the ropes as well. They're not on the ropes. Now, and uh, actually some interesting things that are going to happen. Of course, the obvious sleeper coming out of the Big Ten is Ohio State, who I watched again last night. Uh, tough game against Nebraska. Nebraska's a, a fairly talented team, but uh, Ohio State was able to pull away at the end and win that game. But uh, you go back to the preseason, some people – predicted Ohio State to finish last uh -huh. because of the situation with Chris Holtman coming in so late last summer. And they're sitting at 9-0 and at the top of the conference, 18-4 and overall. And I believe they've won 15 in a row. Uh, yeah, their yep. streak is now at 15 in a row. And the schedule kind of favors Ohio State in the fact that they do not have to play Michigan State again. And they already beat the Spartans uh, the first time or the only time. Uh, the big game there is uh, February 7th, coming up in about two weeks. Uh, that's when Ohio State and Purdue, the two undefeateds at the top of the uh, Big Ten, will meet each other. 
And then another factor to throw in, the very next game after that, uh, Purdue has – they have to go to Michigan State, so they haven't played the Spartans yet. So that could favor the uh, uh, the Buckeyes. Uh, falling out, there's a game last night that uh, was an interesting game, Indiana and Maryland, kind of both of them right there in the middle of the pack. And uh, whoever was lost that game, I think, uh, pretty much uh, – that's where you draw the line that, that don't ha- doesn't have a chance to – finish on top anymore. Indiana's still hanging in there five and three, of course, under Archie Miller. Uh, things haven't gone as well. You know, they're only 12 and eight overall, lost some games that, like to Indiana State that people didn't think that they would lose, but they seem to be getting better as the season goes on. So again, uh, you know, I'm sure if they would finish in the top four or five, uh, Hoosier fans would be very, very uh, happy. Um, one other thing i just throw out there that, uh, well, Purdue does go to Indiana this weekend and that of course is a rivalry game so that might be a tough one for them but here's what you got to go back and look at Purdue you know I think they're ranked third in the country right now uh they actually lost on consecutive days in the battle of Atlanta they lost to Tennessee in overtime it was their first game on November 22nd and then they turned around lost to a team that you like the uh, western Kentucky Hilltoppers and they only lost that one by four points and I'm sure that was a hangover from the loss the day before. But you take those two that two game stretch out of their season and we would probably have the Purdue Boilermakers sitting at the top of the heap of all of the NCAA. And I believe they might be one of the best teams in the uh NCAA this year if if you've watched them. They they got a little bit of everything. They got a great point guard that can score, also a couple seven four, seven three guys, uh Dakota Mathias, who's your tough guy, gritty guy. They just they're, they're just very balanced. Uh, so I, I'm very impressed with Purdue. Uh, looking at the Big East, you look at that Big East uh, standings right now, it's almost exactly what most people predicted. The only uh, team that's maybe down a little farther than people expected is Seton Hall. Uh, but they're sitting at 4-3 and three in fifth place. And if they would have defeated Xavier at home like people thought they probably would, uh, that standings would be almost exactly where we would have predicted with Villanova, Xavier, Seton Hall at the top, and you got Providence, Creighton, Marquette, and Butler in the middle, and Georgetown, DePaul, St. John. So there's really no sleeper there. There's no surprises. There's, I don't know, anybody on the ropes uh, might be Seton Hall if they they uh, lose uh, uh, another game here soon. They would drop to 500 in the league. And here's, and I've talked about this a little bit before, this is, this is going to be interesting to watch, and we'll probably talk more about this on the uh, uh, Razorcast on Thursday when we talk about Xavier basketball. But uh, look at the schedule. It's so unbalanced. Uh, in the next six games, Villanova plays five of them at home. But then they go in a, on a stretch in the middle of February where they play four of five on the road. Their schedule is really out of balance. And of those uh, five games, four of them – on the road at Providence, at Xavier, at Creighton, at Seton Hall, maybe four of the toughest places to play besides Villanova in the, in the Big East. So that's going to be interesting to watch. And if you, on the flip side, the second place team, of course, are Xavier Musketeers. Uh, their their schedule's really balanced in the fact that it's almost like home away, home away, home away. There is one stretch in there where they do play back to back away games in February, but they actually end the the uh, conference play three or four at home. And also another factor for the Musketeers is the, they got actually two uh, buys coming up in February. One of them at the very, the very last week of February and how important that might be to get rest and uh, to rest those bumps and bruises before you hit the conference tournament and uh, probably the NCAA also. So in a nutshell, the, the big East is what we expected it to be. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and some good notes there. I, I look, I look at my sleepers, and uh, we got a couple in each conference. They, uh, you know, uh, North Carolina State, been, they've been dragon slayers in the ACC. Uh, Kevin Keats coming over from North Carolina, Wilmington. You know, so they, they knocked off Arizona when they're at number two. Duke when they're at number two. They've also beat uh, Clemson. You know. It, a lot of people, including myself, you know, wondered why North Carolina would relieve Mark Godfrey the way they did. 
uh, before the season was over. But Keats says uh, after three good years at, at Wilmington, has them playing well. They might be a little way off from really contending, but you never know. They might have a, a Jimmy Valvano type year as well and get hot. And the other team there has got to be um, Clemson. You know, Brad Brunell was one of the teams, as you pointed out, that I had on the hot seat at the beginning of the year. And, um, you know, it was I, – I, I think it was deserving. He, um, you know, he – in his same number of years, he had fewer wins and more games than Oliver Purnell, who took Clemson to the NCAA for the first time in 10 years and had six postseason appearances the last three in the NCAA before he left for DePaul. And Brunell had only had one in his first year, and only two 21 seasons with this last in 2014. But Clemson right now sitting at 16 and four. They're in the top 25, and they're looking good. They're sort of hanging back there, and they're making big um, steps as they go through. In, in the Pac-12 right now, I'd say my sleeper is Stanford. I poo-pooed them earlier in the year, but uh, they just didn't have the program they they've had in the past. But they won an overtime game against USC. They just dumped uh, Arizona State, and they almost took it to Arizona. That game went down to the last minute. They need to be a little more consistent, I think. They've got five losses, the top 25 teams, but they've also lost to teams like Portland State, Long Beach State, and Eastern Washington. I think this week's trip to L.A. will tell them something. They have to go back to USC, um, you know, they beat, like I said, beat them at home in overtime. That might not sit well with the Trojans. Um, and then they have to play UCLA. But right now they're sitting at third in the Pac-12 at, at five and two, and they, they could be there at the end. And my, my sleeper, and it, you know, they haven't really been sleeping. We've talked about them most of the season. But the SEC has been Auburn. You know, Bruce Pearl I thought was another coach on the hot seat. He'd just been 44 and 54 this time at Auburn. With only 16 wins and 54 games in the SEC, but the Tigers are sitting at 17 and two, and they've won some big games. Even though they did drop one to Alabama, who's sort of my other sleeper. I, I keep. They've got to be more consistent. <clears throat> but Avery Johnson's got the tide at, at five and two, and in third place in the SEC. And we'll see what the, I think two teams are like, because um, you mentioned them a little earlier. They're, they're kind of on the ropes. They have to play Oklahoma this Saturday, and I think that will tell a lot about those two teams as we go through. So lots of things going on in all the conferences and lots of changes. We're just sort of past the halfway mark in in most of the conference battles. So a lot of basketball left left to play as well in the big six. Well, and one, one final comment about the ACC. I think you have to point out that Louisville, although, you know, has been a, uh, you, you wouldn't call them a sleeper except for what they went through this fall and have uh, weathered the storm and are in contention uh, right near the top of the ACC. I think that is kind of a surprise. But, again, we talked about David Padgett doing such an excellent job of walking into a very, very tough situation. Louisville's had some big wins here lately. One to, they, they went on the road and beat Notre Dame, which doesn't happen a whole lot uh, mm-hmm. on, the, on their own campus. Yeah. Yeah, that's it. And, and um, what we'll just have to see, I mean, they've got losses to Clemson and, and UK and Seton Hall and Purdue, so their four losses are to all teams that have been in the top 25 at one point or another. They're always going to be there again. They play tough defense down there. It's just it's been a topsy-turvy couple of years down there for the Cardinals. But you're right, uh, that, that would definitely be a, a team to keep your eye on. Some other teams we've got to talk about, and we haven't given them uh, much of their due is, the, um, the the non-Big Six conferences are kind of rearing their head. They now have six teams in the top 25, um, and we'll just sort of go through them conference by, by conference. I guess, you know, one conference, which some people are, are you know, hoping will become the Big Seventh right now, maybe the Big Six and a Half, is uh, the American Athletic Conference. Uh, they've got two teams there, Cincinnati at number nine and Wichita State. At uh, They've dropped a little bit there at number 17. They've been in the top ten all year. You know, Wichita State, one of the teams, took it on the chin two losses last week. But this is a conference, I think, Jim, if they can get you know another exciting team or two, and Houston might be that, this could be a conference um, – 
if they get like a Houston and an SMU to, to perk up like they have in years past, that that could become that big seventh. And that's why Wichita State moved over from the NBC. They're um, they might be regretting a little bit right now with those back-to-back -back losses to Southern Methodist and Houston. But right now, Cincinnati is, is in control. They're up two games with uh, at the halfway mark, and they're they don't play Wichita State until the last five games of the year, in which they play two of those last five games, in court, including the last one uh, at Wichita State. So a lot of things going on there in the ACC. AAC. Yeah. Yeah. And I think here's here's uh, and actually I I found a BPI ranking of all the conferences, and it actually had the American Conference ranked ahead of the Pac-12 right now uh, with their their calculations. Here's what I think is maybe happening in those conferences. I think they maybe have it a little bit easier, whereas the Big Six are playing each other, and you got a tough game every uh, week. Some of those other conferences that are a little bit weaker when you get near the bottom, they, they have teams uh, maybe a little bit easier schedules as they get into their conference schedule. Well, I, I think you can say that. But neither, you know, the two, two big teams we're talking about, Wichita State and Cincinnati, they play tough pre-conference schedules. And, it, you know, the conferences may be a little easier, uh, but, but they prep themselves well. You know, Cincinnati's two losses are to Florida – and Xavier, when they were both in the top uh, 25, and Florida's going to sneak back in here soon, and both of those were on hostile courts. So the Florida game was technically a home game for Cincinnati, but it was uh, it played in New Jersey. And Wichita State would just play everybody. So there's, there's a lot of things that, that can happen, but they're both going to be there at the end. Another conference where the big two teams, and that's about it, uh, for them, it's in the West Coast Conference. St. Mary's popped their head up and beat Gonzaga last week. Uh, and now they're back in the top 25 after a lot of people had forgotten about them. There's not a whole lot else going on in the, 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 the West Coast Conference. The storied teams, as we've talked about in the past. But uh, uh, it's going to come down to Gonzaga and St. Mary's, and they're going to uh, beat on each other. BYU might sneak in there um, and, and play spoiler just a little bit, uh, but I think it's basically going to stay with uh, Gonzaga and St. Mary's. And when you look at St. Mary's, um, you know, they I don't know when you look at them a little more why they sort of fell off the, the map because, uh, you know, their losses, they did have a loss early to Washington State and, and Georgia, but uh, – that's it, and they've rattled off a whole host of wins in a row. But it could be like what you're saying with with Cincinnati and Wichita State. They're not getting the love because there's not a whole lot going on in the West Coast. Yeah, and I think Gonzaga is a little bit of a surprise. They lost a lot from that team that went to the final game last year. But uh, obviously they uh, they are right there again with a 17-4 and four record, uh, sitting second right behind St. Mary's. So I'm, I'm sure – both those teams will probably make the NCAA. I don't oh, think sure. they'll only take the uh, the, the tournament champion. Mm -hmm. Now, in Gonzaga, yeah, they are down a little bit. But when you look at it, their their losses are to Florida, Villanova, and, you know, away to San Diego State just by two, and then that St. Mary's. But uh, you know, uh, Mark Few getting them to their first Final Four last year, they've broken the seal. They may, may not be back this year, may not be as strong, but uh, they'll be there. Staying out west for a little bit of time, got a team that's been nipping at the heel. Another wolf pack been nipping at the heels of the top 25 all year is Nevada. Um, you know, they are just uh, rolling over people out there. They're um, – you know, they they lead the the Mountain West standings. They held off Boise State, who's probably their their top rival, to that just last week. Uh, of course, that was a, a home game, um, but their only losses are to TCU and Texas Tech. Uh, you know, they got talent. Eric Musselman has um, got the NBA background to him with his dad and the time he spent in basketball. He's put, put together a few transfers um, 
and they're not afraid to take on you know some tough teams. Uh, they and they can shoot the three. They're shooting about 42 percent from three point land, and they put up about 82 points a game. So this could be a, a dangerous team that's sort of nipping at the edges. Yeah, I've seen them mentioned before in a team you do not want to play in the NCAA tournament. But, again, another one of those conferences where not a whole lot is, is going on other than that. Um, so, you know, where will they be battle-tested coming out of the um, – or going into the NCAAs, nobody knows. Another team that was always nipping at the, the top 25 has now slipped in, in in the Atlantic 10 plus 4, and, and that's Rhode Island. Um, you know, they're at 15 and 3, and their only losses are to Nevada, uh, Virginia, and Alabama. They've won 10 in a row. They're, they're sitting good. they got a, a guy there, Jared Terrell, who's been on a tear. Um, He's hit, he's hit the 20-point mark on six different occasions. He teams up with E.C. Matthews. Um, you know, they could possibly run the board in what's turning out to be a very weak A-10. There's only four other teams over 500. But, uh, you know, this is a, a conference that you've been familiar with in the past with your association with Xavier. So you know a lot from the past about these Rams, and they're looking pretty good right now. Yeah, and of course they're coached by Danny Hurley, uh, Bobby Hurley's brother, and of course their father, the uh, immortal high school coach out of New Jersey. So uh, yeah, they I think they were picked pretty high coming in in the top 25. Stumbled a couple times in non-conference, but again now they may really fit into what I was just talking about. Now that they're into the where they're playing league games uh, uh, every week, that uh, the the challenge is not quite as high for them as you mentioned. The A10 seems to be a little bit. Uh, down this year, Davidson being the uh, next team there to maybe challenge them. And there's a, a couple of uh, other teams I think people need to put on their radar. Uh, East Tennessee State in the Southern right now is sitting at 16 and four, seven and zero in the league, and two of their four losses are to Kentucky and Xavier. Now that's a team that you you really wouldn't think of much, but with, with their preseason. Schedule. They are looking at well. Not a really tough league, uh, but you know you're looking at you know North Carolina, Greensboro, Walford, Furman, West Carolina, people that you don't think of as really tough things. But East Tennessee State has shown a little metal, and I think another team to watch for me is out in the WAC, the Western Association Conference. New Mexico State is sitting at five and zero in their conference, seventeen and three on the year, and um, Two of their losses are just to St. Mary's and Southern California, but they also have wins over Illinois and Miami. So uh, the Aggies could be another one. And, again, you you don't get many of these uh, shows here on the East Coast because they're played a little later. That could be a team that might make a little noise come March. Yeah, that East Tennessee State team I saw in in, uh, person when they came to Xavier and of course, if I recall, that was one of the teams that had Xavier on the ropes in the second half, had him down by double digits, and Musketeers had to uh, have a great comeback to come back and uh, defeat him. So, yeah, they're a very, very talented team and uh, probably one we're going to see uh, come March. Yeah, and, and, and also you got to watch here when you're talking about conferences and you don't look at everything over the you know the, the WTF category. you got Arkansas Pine Bluff, which leads the Southwestern, Athletic Conference at a whopping 7-0. and They've been running the table out there. And their overall record is 7-14. and <laughs> yeah, They lost all 14 of their pre-conference schedules, but they're beating up on the, the Southwestern uh, Conference there. So, And that's one of those things that, that always makes it tough when you come to the NCAA. You know, I, I bring that up not really to make fun of Arkansas Pine Bluff because they're going to end up, Champions are the good Jackson State nipping at their heels at six and one, but this is a team that, by the constitution of the NCAA, is going to get a spot in the tournament, and they're probably going to end up with a losing record overall. And that's what uh, that's where you, you don't get your tenth team in the ACC or something of that nature. So you got you got to look at everything and remember that come tournament time. We talk a lot about the Big Six. 
But there are other conferences out there, and a lot of them guaranteed a spot in the dance. Well, an interesting thing about the SWAC there, look at their overall records. There's not a team in the league with a winning record. (laughs) Yeah, so it it probably won't be. I don't think Arkansas Pine Bluff is going to go totally undefeated uh, in uh, that they have to play Jackson State coming up uh, on Monday. So that might be uh, where then they got to play them later in February. But a lot of things going on. there. Uh, coming up this week, I'll list some games here real quick because the, the, the madness could uh, continue, and you tell me which one you're looking most forward to. Tonight, you got Clemson going to Virginia, and Kansas has to go to Oklahoma, which you've already mentioned. Uh, Michigan goes to Purdue on Thursday. Saturday, North Carolina State goes to North Carolina. That's always a rip-roaring good time. And then Virginia's got to turn around after that game at Clemson and travel to Cameron Indoor against the Dukies. And Kentucky might have a chance to get their uh, neck back in the race. They go to Morgantown, and they're going to play Bobby Huggins' uh, uh, West Virginia squad. Which ones of those are you looking the most forward to? Well, I, I'd like to watch that Virginia game tonight because I really haven't watched the Cavaliers play very much. Uh, I kind of know what they do. Uh, Tony Bennett, uh, you know, slows the game down and it becomes a possession game and they, they play on defense, keep the score down. But I haven't really had a chance to watch, I know, a whole game of theirs, maybe just snippets here. So I, I, I really want to watch that a little bit. Uh, I'll probably be tuned into the Oklahoma-Kansas game just to watch Trey Young again and see. I haven't seen any of his games where he's really struggled. So, and again, that'll be an important uh, Tipping point, I think, for the Big 12 to see which way uh, it goes with uh, Kansas trying to win their 14th straight uh, 12 championship and, of course, surpass the uh, record of 13 straight seasons in a row that they've either had a share of or won the conference title. So those are the two uh, that really uh, catch my interest. Yeah, lots of good games, and there will be some sleepers in there as well, teams that have just popped out of the top 25 and coming. I'm sure we'll be talking about some more craziness next Tuesday when we rejoin for our Trogcast. And as Jim has already mentioned, join us on Thursday when we have our Razorcast. That's Reeker and Zing talking about all things uh, Xavier basketball. And we'll get to that uh, this Thursday. Uh, well, Jim, uh, we're getting to the fun part of the show here. I'm sure you've got something prepped for me as we get into our trivia and tidbits. Well, one, one thing before we get into that real quick, just got to mention being in the epicenter of college basketball as we are today, Jeff. Uh, of course, uh, the rankings just came out uh, yesterday, and for the first time since 1958, the two major programs in our city, Cincinnati, uh, the Xavier Musketeers and the Cincinnati Bearcats, are both in the top ten. Uh, Xavier coming in in the AP at eight, and uh, the Bearcats coming in at number nine. And actually in the coaches' poll, don't know if you saw this, Jeff, they're actually they tied. high eight mm-hmm. at mm-hmm. number eight. And, uh, again, they both have not been in the top ten at the same time since 1958. Now, I mentioned to you in passing yesterday that I, I believe that was probably uh, – I know that uh, – the Xavier Musketeers won the NIT uh, in 1958, and we know that that was kind of the glory year, some of the, the glory run of the UC Bearcats in that time frame. So it was probably right at, at the end of the 1958 season. And I'm here to report to you that I was wrong. That Ooh. actually took place in December of 1958. Yeah. It was actually in the 58-50, yeah, nine season and here's something that's kind of interesting here's what happened of course uh the musketeers coming off that nit championship started the season out five and zero, and they in december jumped into the top 10 they were actually ranked number 10 and the bearcats were actually ranked at that time number two in the country and uh, but here's the interesting the rest of the story the musketeers finished the 58 59 season at 12 and 13 so after that hot Mm -hmm. five and oh start they kind of uh leveled off and the bearcats of course that again was their glory days and in 1959 they went to the final four and actually lost to the cow bears in the semi 
finals, the national semifinals, and I believe they beat Louisville in the third place game, which they used to have back in the day. So just a, a little bit about our city. We're, we're right here where it's, it's all happening. And, of course, uh, we're in the middle of it all. we got Ohio State just up the road having a great year, too, so a lot of good basketball. Well, well you're going to – Okay, you're going to have some people throwing darts at us, calling us the epicenter. I think the people from North Carolina, New York City, L.A. might might question you a little bit, but we'll we'll live in the moment and enjoy it. All right, here's your trivia for we're talking about Kansas. Trying this, you're going to have a one in nine chance of getting this question right. Okay, <laughs> Kansas working on their 14th straight Big 12 championship. Very quickly, who was the last team in the Big 12 to win it outright that was not named Kansas? Uh, out of the, the, the current Big 12ers, I, my, my first guess would be Oklahoma. And that's a good guess, and you just have to carry on with that answer and say it's Oklahoma State in 2004. Oh. <laughs> here's, a, here's another quick tidbit, though, that uh, before Oklahoma State won it outright in 2004, the Jayhawks had won it the two years before, so if you put that all together, Kansas has won 15 of the last 16 uh, Big 12 championships. And again, I said early on that they weren't going to do it. Uh, they were they lost uh, some players, uh, and actually just this week, Billy Preston, the player they've been waiting on to come off of some type of suspensions for something that happened on campus out there. Actually, I think signed to play pro ball in Lithuania, so he's not coming. But, again, Bill Self has figured it out with who's there. And, uh, again, I, I picked West Virginia when I re, re-picked there. As Kansas lost a couple non-conference games near the end of the non-conference schedule at Arizona State and Washington. I thought, this is the year they're not going to win it. I'm going to tell you, but right now, if I could change back, and I know you won't let me, I'd probably have to go with Kansas. <laughs> Can't change back though. I mean, you know, you, you got to stick with your team. And when you look at that too, it has a fantastic run. Um, and there were a couple ties in there. Kansas State tied them in 2013, and Texas tied them in 08 and 06. But it's, you, you just don't see that in the Big Six anymore. Teams that just continue to dominate and dominate, and they have a total of 27 titles between the regular season and the tournament. Nobody else in the, the Big 12 right now has more than six combined, and that's that's pretty amazing um, to, to have that, that sort of run over and over. But it is the, the home of basketball out there. So we wish Bill well, Self and – I think you have to also, yeah, you're going to say it, uh, Bill Self, but, you know, Roy Williams there. And uh, Mm -hmm. it comes comes down to coaching, I think, I mean, to win that many in a row. Some guy named Fogg was out there, too, you know. Yeah. uh, (laughs) You know, a guy named Dean Smith played there. It's, you know, it's uh, uh, it's just uh, Johnny come lately. It's Wilt Wilt Chamberlain sort of fella. They have quite a tradition out there. All right, let's get on to a, a few tidbits, and then we'll sign off. Um, you know, and speaking of, of Wilt Chamberlain, you know, 1965 in the did this really happen category, the Philadelphia Warriors defeat the Boston Celtics, and Bill Russell missed all 14 of his shots from the field playing against Wilt Chamberlain and the Warriors. I'm sure that's probably the only time in his great career that happened. And yesterday in 1972, George Foreman. The, the grill master knocked out Joe Frazier in the second round in a big upset to take the heavyweight championship in boxing. And 16 years later, Mike Tyson did the same thing to uh, Larry King. Uh, not not uh, Larry King. Who am I thinking of? Larry Holmes. Holmes. Uh, Larry, King. <laughs> Larry King. Larry King. I think Mike Tyson would have taken uh, Larry King <laughs> rather easily. 1984, Annette Kennedy set the scoring record for NCAA women's with 70 points in the game with State University of New York. I haven't been able to track down which branch of that it was. And this, yesterday, was the anniversary of Kobe Bryant's great 81-point feat against the Toronto Raptors. That's the second most points in the game in NBA history. And we can't leave without, I'm sure you talked about it on the Razorcast last week when you are flying solo, but we have to send out our congratulations to Coach Chris Mack, who passed his mentor, Pete Gillen this week to become the winningest coach in Xavier history. 
with his 203rd victory. So lots of things is always happening. As always, we thank you for listening and thank the Grilling Truth for making this happen. We'll be back next Tuesday with another edition of the Trialcast, and please join us on Thursday for our RazorCast All Things Xavier Basketball.